Hello everyone, welcome to ECE 6520. So our course is called Information Theory. And today is our lecture number one. Okay, so let's get started. So information theory from the name, you can see that information theory is about the science of information, right? So that is developed by Shannon in 1948. By Klaus Shannon. So in his seminal paper, so the paper is called A Mathematical. theory of information, uh, of communication. And uh, you may see that, so the original goal for information theory is to develop a fundamental theory for a communication system, right? For example, like today's our 5G communication system, okay? And um, and later on, so this information was developed uh, also for uh, other areas, and it becomes for it becomes the fundamental theory of a lot of systems, right? So we're gonna see that later in this class. Okay, so so before going into the main material of today, so let's go over our syllabus first. Okay, so here is our syllabus and uh, you can find it on Canvas or on our course website. So my name is Mingyu Ji. I'm an assistant professor in the electrical and the computer engineering. And here's my email address. And feel free to send me emails if you have any questions or comments. And in our, so for our class is an online class. So basically we're gonna uh, upload the pre-recorded videos every Tuesday and Thursday right and uh, so the video will be uploaded uh, to our youtube channels right and uh, so let's see this one by one so first uh, the canvas or we have also a website for our class right if you click that so we're gonna go here right so this is our uh, course website so every time so i will list the content we're gonna cover for today right and uh, so i will put uh, all the lecture notes here and uh, also our lecture review slides, right? So basically our course is a very theoretical class and we have lots of math. So we only have lecture notes every time, so I'll write it down. And then we'll have very short uh, lecture review slides to summarize the main content for each of our class, okay? And uh, so there's a link for this video because I'm recording it now, so you cannot see it now. But later on, if you click here, then you can go to the YouTube uh, channel directly, then you can see our uh, video, okay? And uh, similarly, so we have our Canvas page as well. So this is a duplication of the course website, right? So, and here mainly I use uh, the page sec uh, session here. So under page now we have lecture notes and the lecture review slides and the lecture videos, right? So basically here every time I'll upload all the lecture notes, lecture slides, and the link of our lecture videos here, right? And you can uh, see that. And uh, in addition, so you can also see, find all the uh, all the content in the file section, right? So we have different folder uh, for this now, right? So we have syllabus, we have lecture notes, lecture review slides, and the homeworks, right? Okay, so this is um, basically our course website and it, and uh, uh, for all the homeworks I'll upload it here okay later on so those are the main function on canvas that we're gonna use for our class okay and uh, so here is the uh, my YouTube channel and here obviously I, we don't have anything uh, right but later on you're gonna see that we're gonna upload our lecture videos here right so now if you click so you can see those are all the playlists I have now. So this is a course I taught last semester. So it's a signal system, 
right? But here, so we ha also have some other research video in our group. If you're interested, please feel free to take a look at those videos, right? So from today, we're gonna have a new, uh, new playlist here. So that is about our information theory course. Okay, all right. So, okay. So now let's continue uh, looking at our syllabus. So, so the video will be uploaded on every Tuesday and Thursday, right? Feel free to watch it anytime. Okay, and uh, for office hours, so I usually have the open door policy. So basically, if I have any questions, so just send me an email. So we're gonna schedule a Zoom meeting as soon as possible, right? So I don't have any specific hours for office hours, but you know, so so due to our online format, right? So we can have meetings anytime, right? In the last semester, so I have lots of meetings with students at night, uh, right? So when you are available, so we can do this again this time, okay? So here's a short course uh, description of information theory class. Uh, and uh, from here, basically you can see that it's, it's very fundamental, right? It's fundamental of a lot of subjects, including communications and uh, you know, the storage system, cloud computing system, content delivery network, private information retrieval, and cryptography and so on. So that's, so information theory is a fundamental theory for lots of subjects. All right. So here is our uh, learning objectives, right? After uh, com the completion of this course, so you should be able to, you know, have a basic understanding in the general field of information theory, right? As we said before, so this class is a very elementary in information theory, right? So the goal is to give you a general understanding of the field of information theory. And in addition, so it will teach you uh, the theoretical tools that in information theory and apply those tools in solving homework problems, right? And you're gonna see what I mean uh, later in, in the later part of this class, right? And then, uh, and then, so maybe in the very end of the class, so we're gonna see some application of the information theoretical tool in realistic problems, right? And and also in the middle of the class, we're gonna cover something like that, especially in telecommunications, okay? Like, you know, in our 5G system. All right, so the prerequisite of this class is basically the probability and uh, linear algebra, I think everybody should take, right? Those, uh, this class is basically the probability, right? That's the most important thing in this class, right? Later, you're gonna see that in this class, we're gonna you know, start from the probability or random variables. Right. Okay. So the grade distribution is as follows. So basically, we're gonna have uh, we have three parts of this uh, for the gradings, and the first part is homework. Okay. So that's twenty percent. Right. So if you do the homework, everybody should get it. Right. And uh, also the homework is very important for exams. Right. And we have one midterm, which is take home. Okay. And uh, so that obviously will cover the first half of the class. And uh, we'll have one final exam, so that'll take 50%. So midterm will take 30%. Right? The reason the final will take more than midterm is that the midterm will be comprehensive, right? It'll cover the entire class, okay? So it means that you know, if you, don't, you didn't do very well in the midterm, then you're gonna have some chance in the final, okay? Uh, all right, I'll, and also the final exam will be take home as well. And for both midterm and final, uh, so you're gonna have like roughly two days to, to, to finish it, okay? Meaning 48 hours, right? Okay, and uh, the following are the logistics of this class. Uh, so basically, we don't have any TAs for this class, right? And uh, this means that I'll grade everything, right? I'll grade homework and, uh, and exams. And for the textbook, so here, uh, is Tom's cover and uh, and the Jay Thomas book, right? This is a very seminal seminal book for information theory. It's called Elements of Information, so it's second edition. So, so the book looks like this, right? So I hope everybody can buy this book. It's a very very good book, and it's a very elementary book uh, in information theory. Okay, and basically we're gonna follow this book uh, very well and uh, most of the homework problems will be from this book as well, right? 
Okay, and for other materials, there are lots of book in information theory, right? So, so the reason I list this book, the Network Information Theory, uh, the book is like that, Network Information Theory, right, by uh, Basel Gamal and Elhan Kim. So, so we may introduce some kind of modern mathematical tools from this book, right? But you don't need to buy this book. So I will write down very carefully in my lecture notes. So you know you may not need a, you know need to buy this book, okay? And uh, in addition, so if you want to learn more about information theory, some more advanced tools, there are some lots of books that I can recommend. So among them, so this book, so it's called Information Theory and Network Coding. So that's a very good book talking about uh, the network information theory, especially on uh, network coding, right? So this is about like the noiseless network, right? Like the wireline network, okay? So this is a very good book to, to, to for, for further study. And if I want to learn more about some deeper mathematical tools of information theory, right? Because our class is very elementary, right? Very fundamental, but if I want to learn to some deep, uh, deeper, uh, so learn deep, deeper information theory. So you should um, take a look at this book, right? So it's another uh, book called Information Theory, but you can see from the, uh, you know, from the, 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 the name here. So this is focused on the discrete memoryless system, right? A cedar and a corner. So, so this is a very deep book for information theory, and especially for graduate study. Okay, and again, as I said, we have a lot of books in information theory which are really good, and uh, so those are books I recommend in particular, right? So if you are interested in some spe specific field in information theory, I can recommend other books as well. But in our class, we'll just focus on this book, right? The, the elements of information theory. Okay. Okay, great. And here are the grace distribution. And uh, so if uh, you can get it above 90%, you'll get an A. And uh, so this range is A minus and so on. You can take a look at this, right? And, um, uh, and for the curves, so if necessary, so we're gonna curve the grades, right? Of course, you know, the, the goal to curve the grades is for to make you have a better grade, right? Not a worse grade, okay? Uh, but uh, please do not rely on that at this moment, right? And um, uh, and let's go on. So for the evaluation method, we only have two methods here. So why is homework? So every one to two weeks, so we're gonna assign you a homework. So basically, the, as we said, the homework would be, most of them would be like the problems in this book, right? So, and, and the goal of the homework uh, is to make you a better preparation for a midterm and the finals. Okay, so it's very easy to find online solutions, also solutions online for this book, right? But please do not copy and paste, right? Try to solve everything on your own because, you know, um, uh, it's very good for your midterm and finals, right? And uh, for the late policy, so we don't accept any late homeworks, right? And the due date of the homework, of course. So this is, um, you know, under the regular circumstances, right? So if let's say you have some emergency, just please let me know and we can see what we can do, right? And uh, for submission of the homework, so the homework will be due on Canvas uh, before the submission date at midnight, which means it's 11.59 p.m., okay? And uh, one important thing is that please make sure that your homework has, a, you know, the, the scanned version of your homework has a very good quality and is readable, right? To, to, to make you have a better grade, right? For me to either to grade as well. Okay, and uh, so for the midterm, as we said, we have, uh, for the exams, as we said, we have two exams in total. So one is midterm, the other one is the, the final exam, right? The midterm exam uh, will take place in the middle of the course, okay? So we don't have a date yet, but uh, uh, so we're, I'll announce it later uh, in our class. And uh, of course, that will be covered the first half of the class, right? And the final exam is comprehensive, right? And it will be in the exam week, right? Uh, and the both of the exam will be take home. So you will have uh, at least 48 hours, 
to finish it, right? 48 hours, okay, two days basically. Okay, and uh, the exam problems are very similar to the homework problems, but that can be more challenging, right? That's why I give you a long time uh, to solve it. Okay, and uh, for cheat sheets, and you know, you can have it, right? So we, uh, I will encourage you to have some cheat sheets because that that's a way to help you to, to, to review uh, the course content, right? But it's not required. And as we said before, uh, both exam will be open book and open everything, right? So basically you will not find any problems online. Okay, that'll be brand new uh, exam problems. Okay, and the grading will be based on a hundred percent type of our one hundred percentage scale, right? And uh, there will be no me uh, makeup exams. Okay, and uh, of course, as I said, right? If you have some emergency that you cannot, you know, um, make the exam, so let me know, and we'll, we're gonna see what we can do about it. Okay, so. <clears throat> So now let's take a look at the teaching and learning methods and the course policies, right? And first of all, the course content. So the following are the are the uh, topics for uh, this class, right? So we'll have the following topic. So first, we're going to cover uh, the fundamentals of information theory quantities, such as entropy, mutual information, divergence, and their relations, and also the basic inequalities that we're going to use later, like the data processing inequality, Final inequality and so on, right? And second topic is the typical sequence and the typical sets. And then we're gonna talk about the data compression, right? Like the Huffman code, arithmetic code, and so on, right? And then, so we're gonna cover the channel coding theorem, right? And uh, so basically, we'll talk both uh, the discrete memoryless channel. And also, we're gonna talk about uh, the continuous channel, right? Okay. And uh, like the Gaussian channel and the differential entropy, right? And then we're gonna talk about the lossy source coding theorem, like the rate, rate distortion theory and uh, the quantization. And uh, in the end, so we're gonna cover some elementary uh, results for the multi multi terminal networks like the multiple access channel or the MAC channel and also the broadcast channel, okay. And if the time permits, so we may talk about other applications of information theory in modern systems, right? Such as distributed storage systems, private information retrieval, content delivery networks, distributed computing systems, and also cryptography, possibly. Okay. Right, and then, so those are the students' responsibility and the faculty responsibility. You can read those, right? And I'm sure that you have seen those in other classes. And in terms of the collaboration, so it's encouraged. You can collaborate on solving homework problems. And you can see that our class is very mathematics heavy, okay? And uh, some of the homeworks are can be very challenging, right? I will encourage you to collaborate and see how to solve those, okay? And, but please do not copy and paste uh, solutions from others and also solutions you can find online, right? Try to understand as much as possible on your own, right? And if others help you to solve the homework problems, I'll, I hope I'll ask you to write down the other's name on your homework, say, so this student helped me to solve the problems, right? But I will not subtract any points because of that, right? It's encouraged, okay? It's okay. Okay, so please do not cheat, right? All right, okay, so this is, uh, and also I'm sure that you understand the consequences of cheating, right? So it can be very serious, okay? All right, so, and uh, if you're a, a student with disabilities, and then please read this part carefully so we can help you, right? Okay, so those are basically the, uh, the syllabus of our class, okay? So please let me know if you have any questions or concerns about uh, the syllabus, right? Now let's get, uh, get to see the main content for today's lecture. So basically today, in our first lecture. So we're, we have three topics to cover. The first topic is the introduction 
of information theory and see why it is useful, right? And second topic is what is information? So as we said before, so information theory is about information science, right? But we need to answer the question that what is information, right? So if it's not an online class now, I will ask you that, right? You may pause now and think a little bit, right? What's, what is information in your mind, right? And then, so we're gonna cover, so if we know what is information, maybe intuitively, now we're gonna cover how to measure information, right? How do we measure information? right can we quantify information right so also now you can pause the video and think a little bit um okay how we can measure information right maybe you think about have you heard of the words bit right so that may be a way to measure information and then we're gonna see why okay all right so those are the content for today's class now let's see okay the first Let's see what is, let's see the introduction of information theory. So basically, information theory can provide the fundament, fundamental answers for the following questions. on the following questions, right? So basically the goal of information theory, at least in, in the beginning, is to answer the following three questions. So the first question is, what is information, right? That is the content for today's lecture, right? What is information? So we're, we're gonna cover it today, okay? And the second question is again, how do we measure information? Right, that is what we're gonna cover today. And uh, the third question in information theory, so that's important, right, it's very complex. So that is how do we represent information in space and in time, right? How do we represent information in space right this is like a communication system right so if you want to transmit you know some information from one place to another place right so this is how to represent information in space right for example so this is about communication channels right and also in time okay so in time is to say how can we represent information like for the storage system right or let's say the storage media right it's, it's like we store some information and then we're gonna access it on some other time right then how can we represent information okay in the first part uh, let's say in the first Maybe you can see this. So in the first part, in the, let's say in this part, so this is about, let's say the storage system, right? So in the information theoretical words, so this is ab uh, about the source coding theorem. Okay, so that's a big part of our class. And uh, then for how can we transmit information in space? So this is called the channel coding theory.
Okay, so that's another important part of our class. And uh, usually uh, for the source coding theorem, so that's called Shannon's first coding theorem. Right, and uh, for this, it's usually called Shannon's second coding theorem. Okay, so basically, this means that how we can, you know, represent information and store it, right? And this means that how can we transmit information, right? So in this class, after today, we'll basically focus on the third part of, uh, I mean, the third question, right? And we're going to see how information theory can help us answer this question, right? In other words, so, so information theory can help us to solve the problem that how can we store the information in the most efficient way, right? This is something about compression. Right? How can we compress a, you know, some source like image such that it has a minimal size, minimum size, right? And for this part, it's, a, it's for a communication system, right? So given, you know, I say the source information, maybe an image, and then how can we transmit that in the most efficient way, okay? So this is basically the, end, the major focus of our semester, of our class. Okay, so now uh, let's take another view of this problem, right? So as we said, information theory was uh, introduced for a communication system in Shannon's original paper, right? So, so let's take a look at a communication system. Uh, in the following, right? So for a communication system, so normally we have an information source, okay? So in the Shannon's original paper, it gives you a few examples of the information source because that was written by 1948, right? So you may see the application there the uh, example there can be very old, right? So I'll illustrate one there. So in the paper, it, uh, it writes that, so information source can be a sequence of letters in a telegraph of teletype. system right this one example so for some you know more modern application right in today it could be some you know some high definition videos right so that's you know, maybe more familiar with you to you okay and uh, so from the information source right so then so the information source will produce some message right for example those messages could be you know bits right and then so we're gonna have a transmitter right so the transmitter will do some manipulation on the messages here and then transmit over some channels, right? It could be wireless channel, like our cellular system or Wi-Fi system. It could be wireline channel, right? Like the wireline network, okay? So from the transmitter, so then we get our transmitted signals, right? And in the channel, for example, we may you know, there will be some distortion in the channel, right? The channel usually is not perfect. So basically, we could have some noise in the channel, right? And then we can have our signal at our receiver side, right? So here, 
say we're gonna have our received signals right then our receiver Uh, will process this signal, right? You can understand the receiver as the inverse of the transmitter, okay? You, you may understand the receiver as we do some inverse operations then at the transmitter Okay, and then, so we can produce the original message, right? So this is usually is the message had, right? But we hope, so this message is identical as this message. And then, right, the message will be obtained by the destination, right? It could be just, you know, the user, right, who want to watch the video. Okay, so this is basically a diagram of a communication system, right? And from here, so we can see uh, that. Let me change the color here. So from this diagram, and uh, we can see that, so this part, Right, turns red and of course you know also this part so these two parts together so that corresponds to the channel first theorem which is a source coding theorem right you may understand a source coding theorem is to do the compression right even with some loss or without some loss, right? For example, uh, some uh, lossless compression approach uh, could be, for example, the Huffman coding, right? And uh, for the lossy compression approach, so one of the most, you know, the most uh, typical one is the JPEG, right? For the image, right? That's a lossy compression approach. Okay, and uh, everything in the middle, right? Once we get this message, right? So usually this message it could be just bits, right? After compression, we just a sequence of bits to represent the information, right? Oh, let's see. So, so everything here. So this is basically the channel coding theory. Okay. Uh, so for the for the source coding theorem, it's compression, right? So uh, one way to understand this is that is to get rid of the redundancy, right? So for example, if you want to transmit an image and if the, the, the sky is blue, right, you may not want to send every single uh, pixel number, right, pixel value. You may just say, okay, it's blue and then tell the receiver that, you know, there's a big area, it's all blue, right? This is a way to get rid of the redundancy, right? So that's mainly what we do for the source coding theorem. But for the channel coding theorem, on the other hand, because of this noise, right? It means that the received signal is not the same as the transmitted signal normally, right? So in order to make sure that this message is the same as this message, so usually we may need to add some redundancy into this system to make sure the reliable communications, right? For example, uh, let's say it's because of the noise, so every symbol or bit we transmitted has some probability that it will be lost, right? So then if we transmit the same symbol twice other than once, then the successful receive probability at the receiver side will be much higher than just transmit the symbol once, right? This is a, a very easy way to, to add the redundancy, right? So in other words, source coding is to get rid of redundancy and for the channel coding, we're gonna add some redundancy, right? So that's basically uh, an intuitive way to look at this two important problem, okay? 
So this is basically you know, the original uh, view of information theory. So it gives you the fundamental theory for a communication system, right? But as we said before, actually already twice, so, com so information theory nowadays is not only for, it's not only fundamental theory for only communication system, right? So we can say that, so modern, modern, information theory is much more than this. Okay, as we said, right, it also gives you the fundamental theory for cloud computing system, for private information retrieval, for content delivery networks like Netflix, and also for cryptography, and even for machine learning and artificial intelligence, right? Actually, Cloud Shannon has a very big contribution for cryptography, for secure communication, and uh, for artificial intelligence as well and so on. Okay, so we may be able, we may be able to have time to see a few of these points in the end of our uh, class, right? To see uh, some realistic, uh, you know, to see some application of information theory in realistic systems, okay? Okay, so okay, so please let me know if you have any uh, question on you know the intuition of information theory or you know, the introdu introduction of you know our class, right? I'll be happy to answer your question. All right. Okay, so now let's uh, jump into our next topic. So, which is about what is information. Okay, so now I'll give a minute or 10 seconds to think about this problem again, right? So just, just you know, think, what is information, right? Can you use another word to explain information, right? Okay. So there might be a few ways to explain information in your mind, right? But one way that we're going to explain information in this class is that we think information as uncertainty. Okay? So basically, so it means that, in other words, it means that how uncertain we are of the outcome of random experiments, right? So basically, we model the world as lot of random experiments, right? So basically information means that how uncertain we're of the outcome of this random experiment. Does that make sense? Right, let's see an example, right? So let's consider, so EG basically here, this means for example, right? It's short for for example. Let's consider a very basic random experiment, right? That you will learn in 3530, probably right, as the first example, I will guess, right, we consider the random experiment of tossing a coin, right, so that's a very basic example, right, so let's consider two cases of the property of the coin, right, so the first case is that the coin is unbiased, Right, which means that you know the coin is basically balanced. So this means that the probability, so PR in our class basically means probability, right? We may write P as well in later, but so this basically means probability. Well, the probability of has will equals to the probability of tails that equals to half, right? So that's 
pretty typical, right? Probably most of our coin, uh, you know, are like that, right? If I toss a coin with half of the probability, it'll be heads, and with the half probability, it'll be tails, right? So this is one case. And the other case is that the coin is biased, right? So this basically means that the probability of has does not equal to the probability of tails, right? And of course, you know, this two probability, you know, the summation of these two probabilities has to be one, right? So for example, the probability of has maybe like one tenth, and the probability of tails could be nine tenths. Okay, the summation of those two numbers is one, right? So now we have two coin, right? Like one is unbiased like that, and the other one is biased, right? So now let's toss this coin, right? So, so can you tell me for this two coin, two coins? Can you tell me, so which one is more certain, more uncertain? Right, is the first one or a second one, right? So we may imagine that, let's say the first one, so both heads and tails has equal probability, right? If it, it feels like very uncertain, right? It's not towards two either one. But for the second one, right? So in the ideal case, if you told it 10 times, probably nine times will be tails and one times has, right? So you want to guess the outcome. So for this one, I may guess it should be more or less tails, right? And then with pretty high probability that you're gonna be correct, right? But for this one, you really have no idea that, you know, we, it should be uh, either has or tails, right? Because it's very balanced, right? So therefore, and in this example, we may think that, you know, for this guy, right, that is more than certain. Right, does that make sense? Right, this is more than certain, but this is less than certain, right, because we know, you know, more or less, it could be tails, right, because it's very, um, you know, unbalanced, okay. Okay, great, so this is, um, example on um, what is information, right? So we're gonna say information is basically uncertainty, right? If we say it's very uncertain, right? Then we think we may gain more information, right? For example, if a coin is like that, and then if we get the has, so we learn a lot, right? Because we really don't know that, right? But, you know, if it's, it's this coin, and then if we toss it, and then we get a tails, so we don't learn much, right? Because even if we don't do that, we know, you know, more or less it should be tails, right? So basically the more information, the more uncertainty, the more information we get, right? That is the intuition, okay? So, so hopefully now you get, now you get a, a very basic feeling of what is information, right? Intuitively, it should be the uncertainty. Okay, so next, so let's say if information is uncertainty, and then how can we measure information, right? Right, can we quantify information, right? Let's say for a random experiment, let's say tos tossing a coin, Right? So after this, after tossing a coin, how much information I get, right? By learning the outcome. Okay, so this is how to measure information. Right? We need a unit there, right? For example, if we want to measure the volume of water, it should be gallon, right? And if we want to uh, measure the length of something, it should be like feet or meters, right? So so now this is like how can we measure information, right? So basically, we're gonna measure information in bits, okay? But 
But let's see why we can do that. Okay. So, so now from now on, it'll be very mathematical heavy, right? So we're gonna basically give you uh, the derivation of how to measure information. Okay. So in order to do that, so we basically need to, uh, you know, consider a random variable, right? So let's give you a definition of the random variable that uh, we consider. Okay. So we consider a discrete random variable x. Okay, so capital X in our class means a random variable. Okay, and this random variable will take values in the finite set. Okay, so we denote that as this curly X. Okay, so basically, this is a set of the outcomes. Right, for example, right in the previous example, the tossing coin example. Right, so this the set of X, right, so that is nothing but has and tails, right? But we're gonna give it a number, right? So we say zero and one, for example. Let's say zero represent has and one represent tails, okay? So therefore, with that said, we say the event x, capital X equals to lowercase x, right? The lowercase x is basically the outcome, right? Or the realizations, right? So this is the event that X takes on the particular value, small x that is in the set of this curly X. Right. Okay. In this case, we can say uh, that so this zero and one are basically the small x, right? We say if capital X equals to let's say one, it basically means that the outcome is tails, right? Okay. So this is for the definition of our random variable. And because we have a random variable, then we can define the probability mass function, right? Or we call it PMF. The probability mass function of our random variable X is nothing but we denote it by small px, so that equals to the probability that capital X equals to small x. Of course, small x is in our finite set, curly x. Okay, so this is our PMF. Okay, so after that, so we're ready to define our measure of information, or you know, the measure of the uncertainty of random experiment or random variable, right? So we denote H x so this x is our capital x right that's our random variable it's our random variable okay so we denote this as the uh, measure of uncertainty of the random variable capital x okay so this is just notation, right? We denote this as uncertainty. And now we're gonna see what is the value of it, right? So before uh, looking at that, so now, uh, so we can observe that. So 
so this h of x, right? Let's uh, maybe consider uh, consider this example here. So when we talk about uncertainty, so it will determined by the probability that uh, it has or the probability the outcome is tails, right? So it doesn't matter the value here, right? It doesn't matter if it has or tails. The only thing that matters is the probability of the has or the probability of tails. Right. So in other words, so the uncertainty can be understood as a function for the probabilities, or right, or the functions of the PMF. Right. This is what we're gonna uh, write down now. So basically, h of x is a function of the PMF. Right. So we can denote the PMF as following. Let's say p x and for all x in this, right? And uh, so this is called, we just call it entropy now, right? So we're going to see what that is, right? But it's just called uncertainty of information as entropy, OK? And um, so for example, we can write h as a function of px1, px2, where x1 and x2 are the realizations, right? And so on until p, let's say x small n, right? And clearly here, we assume that uh, for this curly x, the size of it or the cardinality of it is n, OK? So this is basically, um, basically, uh, the notation of hx, right? But we didn't say anything other than notations, right? We just represent the uncertainty at h of x, and intuitively we think h of x should be a function of px, right? That just makes sense, right? All right. At this moment, normally what we should do is to introduce the formula of h of x, right? So basically it tells you, okay, that's the definition of entropy. Right, so it's kind of like a magic formula, right? It makes lots of sense, and magically, it can explain lots of stuff, right? And uh, so this can make information uh, theory uh, very uh, mysterious, okay? Right, but tell you telling your formula, and then it works in lots of realistic applications, right? So that's not what we're going to do, right? So we're what we're going to do in the following is to derive the definition of entropy. So actually, the formula of entropy is not like uh, a random guess, right? And then it works by Shannon, right? So actually, it comes from lots of intuitive axioms, right? Because of those axioms, and then we can derive um, the formula of entropy uh, and show it is the only possible form of the definition of information, OK? So this is what we're going to do. So basically, we're going to introduce some axiom and see whether it makes sense or not, right? So the first axiom is that, so remember uh, that we can represent this h as this, right? So basically, we're going to write h half and the half. So this basically means that this half is PMF, right? Let's say we're tossing, it's like exactly like the example we gave before, right? It's like tossing a, a unbiased coin, right? So each, the has has a probability of half and the tails has a probability of half. And then, so what is the uh, quantity of the information for that, right? So this is basically like normalization Right, it could be any number, right? Feel free to write down any number there, right? We, we have to start from somewhere, right? So so in this case, so we just agree that this equals to one, okay? You know, this can be understand as one bit, right? If it doesn't make sense to you now, bear me for a moment, right? So the other word, this is like, if for an by a bias coin, right? So in order to represent outcome, we just need one bit, zero or one, okay? And of course, now you may think, you know, if it's a bias coin, we can also do this, right? 
but in the next next class we're gonna see that is not the case right we can use fewer actually number of bits to represent that case right so in this case let's agree that this equals to one okay as i said again so it can be any other number doesn't matter because it just defines the unit of information right we think that is a single unit of information okay so the second axiom is kind of interesting so we consider this case again it's a um, it's a number of event a number of outcomes and each of them has a probability of one over n right and of course we have n items here right n terms right so for this very special function we give it a name called small h of n right so assume that this function is a monotonic non decreasing function of n right let's see whether it makes sense or not right so non decreasing more or less means is you know either stay the same or increasing right so this means that the higher n the more uncertainty does that make sense yes it does right because let's say here we have only two possibilities of outcomes right and then I say if you consider something like h one third one third and one third right that so this two is n right so if we increase from two to three so we have this guy right and for this guy we have three outcomes right which is more than two outcomes right therefore in this if we do this experiment right it should have more uncertainty right because we have three outcomes compared to the two outcomes, right? So clearly, intuitively, this should be bigger than that, right? Because it has more outcomes, right? And uh, they, they have equal probability, okay? So, so this basically means that, so this guy is a monotonic non-decreasing function of n, right? That is what, what do we mean, okay? So let's uh, give it some label here. So we call the second one as, uh, this first one as axiom one the second one as axiom two, right? And now let's see the third one, which is our axiom three, okay? Yeah, maybe we're just writing this way, right? Axiom one, axiom two, axiom three. Axiom three is that we assume hx is a continuous function of the px of the probability right so the h is a continuous function of this entries okay so that's our the third axiom okay and uh, the last one is important so the last axiom which is a4 so this is called grouping property So you can see the first three axioms kind of very intuitive, right? This just give a unit, right? We have to start from someone, right? And second, right, it means that if we increase n, we have more uncertainty. So therefore, this should be a non-degrading function. And the third one is that, so we just assume, so this is for the mathematical convenience. You're gonna see where we use this, right? So this, we just assume, you know, the function of, you know, the, the the, uh, the function of entropy is just behave nicely on, uh, on the variables, right? And uh, the last one is the grouping property, right? This is kind of interesting. So now, before introducing the formal definition of the uh, grouping property, let's see an example, right? So we consider a alphabet or the set like one, two, three out of three values, right? And the probability, let's say we define this as P1, this as P2, this as P3, those are the PMF, right? And in this case, so when we do this experiment, so can we do as follows, right? So when we, you know, if we want to, let's say, run this experiment and see which one that is, so we can understand the experiment as two steps, right? The first step, 
is that so we consider a new alphabet or a new set as this so we combine the outcome of one two right so we consider this one two as a you know as one outcome right if the result is one so it's here if the result is two it's also here right consider one two as one outcome and then we have another outcome which is three okay so the first step is to consider the all the possible uh, outcome like are two outcomes instead of three okay so in this case and for this kind of a new system and we can see that the probability of this guy would be p1 plus p2 right and the probability of this guy would be just p3 right it's a new system right and in the second step then we're gonna see so which one we really get uh here if you know we didn't get three right if we get three then we're done right and if we didn't get three we're gonna see so which one we get uh are, are in here okay the second step now the system is only like a system with one two okay and in this case so then what is the pmf right so if we jump into the second step we know that we're in we're get e so what we're getting is either one or two right if that is the case therefore so given that so the probability that we're getting one is what right it should be p1 over p1 plus p2 right so this is a you know you should learn that from the probability right it's a conditional probability right so this is basically p2 over p1 plus p2 right and this event so this together will happen with probability of p1 plus p2 right if because if we're here then then we go to a second step right that's basically the idea right therefore we can understand the, the experiment so note that the experiment is the same as before we didn't do anything other than that right this is just another understanding of the same experiment right we combine first two outcome right and then we see which outcome we get in this if we're here okay so in this way so probably we can understand the uncertainty or the quantity of information as follows right so this is what we want to characterize right so can we understand this as you know some operation for the first system and the second system or the first step and second step can we do that right so basically what we can do is that so the, the total uncertainty would be the uncertainty of the first one right which is h p1 plus p2 and p3 right so this is the uncertainty of the first system right and and then we have to add some uncertainty of the uh, some uncertainty of the second system, right? So if we just look at the second system, so the uncertainty would be what? P1 over P1 plus P2 and P2 over P1 plus P2, right? This is the uncertainty of the second system, right? But should we just add them all together? So maybe not, right? So if we, you know, the, there's a chance that uh, there's a chance that we may not go to the second system, right? So if we want to see the uncertainty in the second system, then it has to happen with probability P1 plus P2, right? Therefore, what well, we times P1 plus P2 here, okay? So again, so this is from intuition, it's axiom. Right, it's not, uh, you know, a derivation. Right, we just think that makes sense. Right, so if we understand the experiment as this two step, right, the total uncertainty should be the uncertainty of the first one, and uh, the probability that the second step happened, times the uncertainty of the second one. Right, that just makes sense. Right, so think this again. See whether it makes sense to you. Right, so this is basically the idea of the grouping. Uh, property right okay so in general 
now we can write it formally so basically the grouping property means the follows let's say we have h of px1 oh, px2 px3 and so on until px small n right so this guy will basically equals to so we're going to group the first two outcomes right that equals to for of p1 px1 plus px2 and then px3 px4 and until uh, pxn right and add so the probability that you know if we are here right so the probability of p1 uh, px1 plus px2 together multiply the uncertainty of this and that normalized by this probability right so that's px1 over px1 plus px2 okay plus probability of x2 and x1 make it clearer px1 plus px2 okay so this is very important okay so that's a grouping property so let's yeah, put a circle around it okay so this is a general grouping property right but uh, so you can see that for this guy we just group the first two right and uh, because of this so basically we can even further generalize it to any grouping right we can group any amount any numbers those right all together right therefore uh, because of that we can show easily that we can have a generalized grouping axiom okay so the generalized grouping axiom is as follows right so we're going to have different labeling for the for the outcomes okay so we're going to deny de denote the outcomes as xij right this is small xij right because those are the realizations or outcomes right so basically uh, i is a group index right we say we have k groups in total Right, this is a grouping, group index, right, and say J is the, is the index of the elements in each group, right? So this is the index of elements in each group okay so for example let's say we can have like this let's say the first group is x11 x12 right? we just have two uh, two elements and then the second group yeah we could have x12 x to x21 x22 x23 x23 and x24 okay the third group for example we can have x31 x32 x33 right we can have three elements right never doesn't matter right the fourth group Let's say we have x41 and x42 that's it right so so this is a basic example right? we'll just do some relabeling so we're going to combine this two combine this two combine this three combine this two and see what we can get right so uh yeah and uh, we can see uh, that based on this grouping right we can represent our h p x i j where Let's say let's write down the range of i and range of k, right? And then this guy, 
will just be equals to what? So the uncertainty or the entropy of the probability after grouping, right? Let's uh, maybe oh, let's recall this. So basically, what we have here is that so the first term is something after grouping, right? We have this summation here, right? Because now uh, we have more groups. So basically, we can write down the first term as the following. Summation of, let's say, j from 1 to mi, pxij, right? So that's the total probability, the summation of the probability in each group, right? And now we only have one grouping index. OK, so this is the first term. We're not done yet. And then for the second term, so it's a double sum, right? First of all, we need to uh, sum here for the total number of groups, i from 1 to k. And then times, and then here should be the probability that uh, each group will happen, right? The outcomes in each group will happen, right? So this is a uh, summation of from j. Uh, from 1 to m i and then we have this right this is a probability and then inside we need to multiply the normalized probability for each group right therefore it will be p x i j over summation j from 1 to m i p x i j right and here clearly uh, j is from oh, j is from 1 to m i right so again this is very important we're going to use it to derive the, the derive the formula of entropy right so we're going to circle that it's very important okay so this is our axiom 4 which is the most complicated axiom right so for those four axiom it's something that we agreed on, okay? So it's not a mathematical proof that that has to happen. So that just makes sense for information, right? So based on this four axiom, so we're going to show that uh, so there's only one possibility for the formula of entropy, okay? So that is uh, what we're going to show, okay? So, so we're not going to write it now Right, maybe you heard of that already before, but let's try to derive it. Right, so in order to derive it, we're gonna have two lemmas first. Right, so let's see. So the first lemma, is that h of n times m, so that equals to h n plus h m or any mn that is a positive integer. So this notation basically means positive integer z plus, right? And this notation means in. Okay, so now let's try to prove this lemma. So, so now you can also pause the video and see whether you can use the axioms to prove it, right? It's not hard at all. Okay, so, so first let's recall the definition here, right? So what is H N M? Okay, so let's try to recall it. So basically, what it did here is that we denote H N as this guy. Right? Still remember? Okay. So let's see. So basically, this is nothing but H one over M, one over N times M, right? every term is the same and in total we have n times m elements right or terms okay and for each of this can be understand i mean understood that maybe x11 right this is maybe x12 and so on until this guy is x in the end right yeah, just notation here, right? It doesn't have to be x12 here because there's a chance that I only have one element in group one, right? So just, okay, so here,
So now let's do some regrouping here, right? In order to get this, so we have to do some regrouping. So for the regrouping, yeah, because of, because of that, so basically what we're going to do is that, so we're, we're gonna group every M element into one group, okay? So it basically means that the first group has x12, x11, x12, x until x1m, right? We group every m element as one group, okay? And then we can see that the probability that, you know, the outcome will be in this group is the summation of x px11 plus px12 plus until let's say px1m, right? And we know each of this has a value of one over uh, m time, n times n, right? This guy basically equals to what? One over n times n multiply m term, m terms, right? That is one over n. Okay, so it means that outcomes in each group with probability of one over n, right? And then let's see the second group. The second group has outcomes of x21, x22 until x2m, right? Again, uh, the probability that the outcome will be in this group two two plus until x2m, so that equals to what? One over n again, right? And uh, how many groups we have in total? Right, well, overall we have n times m element, and if for each group we have m element, therefore we have n groups in total, right? So for the nth group, so basically we have xn1, xn2, until xnn, and the probability that outcome is in this group would be again the same as before, right? So x n n so that will be one over n okay so with that said and now we're gonna use the generalized a4 right x m4 so we just generalize the grouping property right therefore we can have h n m so that equals to as you hear the first term right so this is basically the entropy of so every item inside is a summation of the probability for each group, right? So that is nothing but basically it's h one over n because so each of them is one over n here, right? Therefore it's h one over n, one over n, and uh, so on. Okay, and uh, clearly here we have n terms, right? N terms, and then. The second part is that we're gonna do a summation from one to n because of n groups, right? And the probability here should be the probability of the outcome in each group, right? In the ice group. So that is again, one over n as we computed here, right? And then in the end, what is inside is, so is a probability that each outcome will happen, but given the fact that dot com is in a certain group i, right? Therefore, inside that will be p, let's say, x i one over the summation of, let's say, one over m p x i j, right? And clearly, so this guy is nothing but one over n, right? I mean, downstairs, maybe let's so downstairs is basically one over n, right? And upstairs we can see this is nothing but one over n times m, right? Because every item will happen with this probability. So therefore the entire thing will just equals to one over m, right? And then we have, right? We have the rest, right? The rest will be the same as this one, right? The result is basically one over m, one over m and so on. Right, and in total here, how many terms do we have here? Right, we're gonna have m terms, right? 
Okay, to get now, let's take a look at well, what can we get after that. So this is basically the first one is nothing but H N. Right, and second one is that, so because each term have the same value here, right? If we sum from one to n, uh, one over n here, we just one over n multiply n, and then this guy is nothing but hn, right? And then this equals to hn plus hm, and then we're done, okay? Great, now we show this formula. Let's call this lemma one. Okay, so this is the first lemma that we want to show, right? So we can see that basically uh, we use the generalized group axiom to show that, okay? So maybe we mark it here. So this is by the A4 basically, right? Okay, good. So next, let's take a look at lemma two, right? So lemma two is that we're gonna quantify this guy, right? So can we see the value of this guy, right? Remember that this equals to h, one over n, one over n, and so on, right? So from the axiom, can we guess or can we show the value of that, right? So basically, I'll tell you that this value equals to log two uh, log n, right, based on 2, right, this is the only possibility, right, so let's see how we can do that, right, okay, proof, so how to think about this problem, right, if I tell you something like that, right, what do you think, right, so how about we try something like that, right, let's say if we say h to the power of two, h of two to the power of two, what's that? <clears throat> right, it's two to the second, right? So that's h two times two, right? Then because of the lemma one, right here, let's say we use lemma one, right? Which is this one, like if we say it's two times two, then we can separate those, right? It's, it's, it looks like log, right? So, but we're gonna show log is only possibility, right? It's not just a coincidence. It's like H2 plus H2, that's two times H2, right? And, uh, okay, so if we continue doing this, let's say if we do that, so that equals to three times H2, right, looks pretty good. And then if we do that, so that's four H2, right? And if we continue doing that, let's say if two to the power of k, that equals to k times h2, right? By the way, h2 is what? h2 is nothing but our axiom one, right? So in our axiom one, oh, so this guy is basically h2, right? h2 is basically just one, okay? Therefore, so now we can write this as just k, okay? Okay, so, so what does that mean, right? So we, we can show this is just k, right? So, so why do we even care about this two to the power of something, right? Basically the base doesn't matter, right? The reason we use that is we have this value, right? If we don't use this base, we just use another value there, right? It's not a big deal. Okay, but from this kind of idea using, you know, this exponential number. So actually, we can think about something like this. So any positive number, right, let's say n, can be represented by, you know, can be bounded by two of the such numbers, right? For example, let's say a n has to be less, bigger than or equal to 2 to the power of k, and less than or equal to 2 to the power of k plus 1. Right, does that make sense? Right. In other words, it means that so for any n, right? So this notation means for for all n, for all, right? For all n, there must exist, right? This notation means exist. There must exist a k such that 
this happen, right? ST means means such that. We're gonna use this notation a lot, right? Okay, so therefore, and uh, so we can bound n like that, right? And then we say by using axiom two, right, which is the monotonic uh, non-decreasing property of H n, right? Then we can basically write to the power of k less than n less than h to the power of k plus one. Okay, and then what do we do? Right, we know this value and this value. Right, this value is nothing but k, and this value is nothing but k plus one. Right, and then we can bound uh, h of n between this. Okay, looks pretty good, right? We can bound h n within, you know, one unit. Okay. But guess what, right? From here, what can you see? Yeah, from this formula, what can you see? Right, from here. Also, note that. So if we take a log function on all of them, what do we get? Remember that log function is a monotonic increasing function, right? Although the speed is not fast, but it's monotonic increasing. So from here, we can basically get this directly, right? Log k will be less than or equal to n less than or equal to k plus 1. Uh, sorry, not log k, just k, right? We'll take the log based on 2, right? So we can basically get this. Uh, here is log n, right? We can basically get, get this formula, OK? So now look what we have. So now we have this, and we have that, OK? Looks pretty good, right? But can we say hn equals to log n? Be from this two formula, can we say that? Right, because our goal is to show hn equals to log n based on two. Can we say that? No, we can't, right? We know hn, you know, is bigger than k, less than k plus one, and the log two n is bigger than k and less than k plus one, right? But the exact value of these two, we know they are close, within one unit probably, or within two units, but we cannot say they are the same, right? So this idea may not work, right? Therefore, let's call it a try, right? We just try this approach and see whether it works or not. But it turns out it doesn't work. But from this approach, so can you uh, think anything similar that can work? Can you, right? So we say, doesn't work. We're not there yet, right? This may be the way that you know Shannon came up with a solution, right? So let's see uh, what can we do, okay? So basically, so although this idea is not does not work exactly, but it's almost working, right? So basically, what we're going to do is as follows. So now, again, you may pause the video, and uh, maybe you can come up with your own approach, right? Very similar idea, right? So basically, what we're going to do is as follows. So we can choose an arbitrarily arbitrarily large number n so that is a positive integer then we can show there exi always exists a k such that this n to the power of n so we just make our number bigger right this n is the n that you know, we see here right we just make the number bigger Okay, and similarly, we can also show this has to be bigger than 2 to the power of k, less than or equal to 2 to the power of k plus 1, right? It can also be bounded, right? And then using the very similar approach as we introduced before by a2, and what we can show here is that instead of hn here, right, it's basically we need to raise n by, uh, raise small n by capital N, right? We can show that, right? Okay, great. But this is very special, right? Do you remember lemma one now, right? Lemma, let's recall it. So here is lemma one, right? But now we just, instead of n times m, we have n to the power of capital N, right? Or we better use something like that, right? We know this equals to that, right? So if we replace two by n, so what we're going to get is this, right? n h n 
okay so you can see so this is by lemma one so we're almost there you can see that right so then from here we can see we divided by n on both sides okay and uh, this last term can be written as k over n plus 1 over n right and uh, you know n is something that we're freely to pick right if we pick n very large you can see this guy is basically negligible right okay so very good so basically this formula means what right if you use a mathematical analysis you know language so so this basically means the follows right so it means that for any small or arbitrarily small epsilon okay that is bigger than zero so we can always bound hn and this guy within epsilon okay so this is true all right okay again so from here we play the same trick right we also note that so if we take the log on both sides right therefore what we get is k less than n log n log based on two right of course less than k plus one okay and then we're gonna play the same trick again here so we divide it by n on uh, both sides right we get k over n less than log 2n less than k over n plus 1 over n right and from here you now again we can get very similar formula as this one right it means that for any small epsilon and then we can definitely have log 2n minus k over n so that is less than epsilon right we pick the same epsilon here right doesn't matter but we pick, just pick the same epsilon here okay okay very good therefore so now are we ready to see the difference between hn and log 2n right how about with this with what we have so far can we bound this right so the trick here we use is very typical so what we're going to do with that we're gonna add or minus k over n and add k over n minus log 2n right then we're gonna separate these two guys right so this is called use the triangle inequality right we can show that this guy is less than or equal to hn minus k over n plus log 2n minus k over n okay right and we know each of this is less than epsilon right and then this is 2 epsilon right so what does this mean right it means that so this guy the difference between this guy can be arbitrarily small right remember that epsilon can be arbitrarily small if we pick capital n is large enough so epsilon will approach zero right so this basically implies that the reason here is that epsilon is arbitrarily small right therefore it basically means that h n equals to log 2 n and then we finish our proof right so the difference between these two guys will approach zero okay so now we're done with the lemma two so basically lemma two means what means it means that right if i have n outcomes and each of them with the same probability then the measurement of information is basically log 2 n right okay and then from here let's see whether we can generalize it to any case okay okay so let's take a look on how to do that 
So, so, so basically now you can also, again, stop the video, right? Pause the video and think whether you can do this on your own, right? So basically the idea is really not very, very hard, right? So now basically we have a number of events that have the same probability, right? And uh, how to get different probability, right? So now remember what we show is that if all the PX is identical, it's one over N, then we're done, right? And, but if all the PX is not uniform, right? It's not the same, then what do we do, right? So you should immediately think about the grouping property, right? So how about we group, you know, some N, you know, together, and then we can basically, you know, have any uh, possible PMF, right? But there's a condition for that, right? If we group, you know, some over a number of one over N, so what we're gonna get is, for the probability should be rational number, right? We can now get irrational number, right? Therefore, so we consider the simple case, right, which is that we suppose our PMF, PX, for all X is a rational PMF, right? So rational PMF is what? It basically means that for any PXI, we can write this as some NI over capital N, right? Where, you know, capital N is some integer, right? Let's say we say we exist any uh, we exist capital N such that PXI equals to that, right? So this is basically the definition of the rational PMF, and clearly we need the condition that if we sum over uh, all the NI, right, let's say we have k k of them, right? That is um, capital N, right? Okay, and because the summation of all the PX has to be uh, one, right? Okay, great. So now we're gonna apply our generalized grouping axiom again, right? So in order to do that, so we basically, we consider another PMF, which is uniform, right? Consider another PMF, which is P, let's say Y, I, J, where small y is the outcome, right? That is one over N, right? We have, let's say I is in this range, and the J is in a different range, right? It's in from one to NI, right? So clearly the outcome of XI uh, corresponds to YIJ where uh, J should be between this, right? Okay, so now what we can do is that we can write down the generalized grouping axiom, right? So the generalized grouping axiom is as follows. So we have, you know, the total thing is this P, Y, I, J, right? And uh, that is, so let us write down the range of all the parameters here, right? So that equals to what? Right, that equals to the first term is after the grouping, right? So basically, we're gonna group, uh, you know, the Y with the same I together, right? So that's our XI, right? So basically, that equals to H P X I, and our I is from one to K, let's say, okay? And uh, you can see, so this is the first term, right? This is nothing, uh, this is nothing but what? Our hx, right? So remember, hx, this is, uh, so the pxi is our, uh, the PMF are uh, of the, the random variable x, right? Therefore, this is basically h of x. And, um, and what is that? Right, this is nothing but some uniform distribution, right? The entropy of uniform distribution. We just show that from lemma two. So this is what? Log two N, right? Or we say this is nothing but H capital N, right? And uh, this is lemma two. Okay. And uh, I mean, this is axiom A4. Okay, we're not done yet, right? 
So we need to add an, another term, right? Which is sum from i to k because we have k groups and then probability is pxi, right? Because the sum of all the probability for, uh, for yij over j is just basically the pxi, right? And then we need to multiply our entropy here. So again, every term, what is that, right? It's one over n is a probability that each item will happen with the probability that the group, the outcome in the group can happen, right? That is nothing but an i over n, right? And this is nothing but what? One over an i, right? And uh, we have multiple of those, right? They're all identical, right? Clearly, from here we can see this guy is what? It's just H and I, right? And uh, again, because of lemma two, this equals to log two and I. Okay, so with that said, so let's see what can we get, right? And uh, then we can get basically, let's rewrite it H, uh, HX, this guy will be equal to this guy minus this guy, right? And this guy is H uh, is uh, log 2n minus summation pxi log 2ni. Okay, so now let's play some trick here, right? So what we're going to do now is to combine these two terms, right? How do we combine? So we can do something like this. We can make the first term as a summation, right? So because this is nothing but one, right? And then times log in my minus all right. Okay, then so now we can take the summation out. Inside is log two. So it should be n over n i, right? But this is not what we want. Remember, pxi equals to this, right? So we can write it, write it reversely, like n i over n, and then put a negative sign in front. All right? Therefore, this equals to pxi, and this, as, as I said before, n i over n is just pxi, right? log 2 pxi okay and now we can see we're done almost right hx equals to this guy right so let's mark it in red so this is the entropy or you know the quantity of the uncertainty so we show that equals to this guy okay very good so are we done Okay, not yet exactly. Remember, we have an important assumption here. So we assume that Px has to be rational. So what if for irrational number, right? What Px is not rational, right? So what should we do? Okay, so remember that we still have one axiom that we didn't use yet, which is axiom three. Right, assume that, so maybe uh, let's recall axiom three here. So in our axiom three, so assume hx is a continuous function of px, right? Clearly this is for each x, right? Therefore, by using that, we can easily show that it also works for the irrational number, okay? Because, so every irrational number can be approximately, uh, can be approximated by a rational number at any you know distance right any small distance therefore so this can be easily show okay by using a4 okay if a4 basically is that hx is continuous of px right then for any px, 
and then we're done, right? Because it's continuous, then it works for rational, it has to work for irrational. Right? So h of x has to basically equals to sum over i, pxi, this is for all i, right? Log 2, pxi, okay? And uh, this is basically what we called the definition of entropy, right? But clearly, from this lecture and from now on, you can see this is not just a definition, right? It's a derivation, right? From all the axioms that we have seen before, so this is the only possibility to define the uncertainty of information, okay? Great. And because we assume that, you know, this small h2 is 1, right? Or in other words, this is based, basically like we take log base 2, right? In this case, the unit of it is called bits, right? So this is the information bit, right? So the, you know, the meaning of it is slightly different compared to the bit that we mentioned in our everyday life. Okay, so we're gonna understand this better in our uh, future lectures. But now let's you know bear it right. If it's log two, it's called bit, right? So later on you're gonna see that. So the best we can do f to compress a source is basically equals to this number. So it coincides more or less with the bits that we talk in our everyday life. Right? This is kind of magic, but we're gonna see why later. Okay, and there's another. A log that we use in practice, which is ln, right? This is based on e, right? So in this case, the unit is called net, right? N A T. Okay, and those are two kinds of units. Depends on you know what is based here, and that we use for uh, entropy. All right. Okay, great. So that is the end for our first lecture. I hope that is not so overwhelmed. Right, so basically, I think it's always good to tell you why we define define entropy in this way instead of just show you the formula and you think it's a, just a magic, right? And uh, what what I go over here is basically Shannon's proof, right? If you're interested, please look at uh, Shannon's original paper, which is extremely nice, obviously, right? Okay, so let's end for today. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. So I'll see you in our next lecture. See you. Bye.